All right, section 11.2 is titled Curves, Polygons, and Symmetry. So we're going to hit on a number of different topics, some things that you are going to be very familiar with and some maybe that you're not as familiar with. All right, so first of all, we're going to talk about properties of curves. A curve is any object similar to a line in a plane. The easiest way to think of this is it's a path drawn on paper. Okay, so something that you can draw on paper. A curve is considered to be connected if it can be drawn without living a pencil, lifting the pencil. Connected. Um, in algebra, the word we would use here is continuous. But for geometry, we call it connected because continuous has to do with, with certain types of curves. Simple. A simple curve is one that does not cross itself. And there's one more, it's on the next slide because not everything fit on this one. The last one over here is closed. Closed is a curve that has the same starting and stopping points. And we're going to come back to polygons. So just write starting and stopping in there. Okay. All right, we've got four pictures on this screen. And I know I don't have all the pictures in at different points on your note sheet. And there's actually really good reason for that. And it's not just because I want you to practice drawing. Um, some things are easier to copy and paste from program to program and some are more difficult and for whatever reason these were not simple to copy and paste into your note sheet. So they aren't hard to draw though. Alright, so the first one, what we're going to do is we're going to write down whether they are simple or whether they are connected, whether they are simple, and then whether they are closed. Those are our three descriptions, okay? So the first one, how would you categorize it? It is simple. What else? Right, that's not one of them that we're going to use. We're going to look at the last four. So connected, closed, and simple. So this one is simple. What else is it? Is it connected? Yes, it is connected. Connected means that I don't have to pick up my pencil to draw it. <laughs> um, is it closed? No. So this is a simple, connected, non-closed curve. I'm only going to write what they are underneath them. If you want to write not closed underneath it, feel free to do so. Okay, so this one's simple and it's connected. How about the second one? It is simple. Is it connected? Yes. Is it closed? Yes, it is. And I don't care where the starting and ending point is, but wherever you start, that's where you're going to end in order to trace around the entire figure, okay? Looks like a cat pillar, kind of. Actually, maybe like an earthworm. All right, the next one. This one actually is a shape we're going to encounter later. What about this one? It is simple. Is it connected? Yes, it is. Is it closed? Yes, it is. How about this last one? Yeah, it's, this one's not simple. It is connected. And it is closed. So I didn't draw you an example of one that would be not simp or not, which one did I not do? Not connected. Uh, but not connected could look just like this right? That would be not connected. I actually have to pick up my pencil in order to draw this shape. It doesn't work otherwise. So this would be an example of something that's not connected. Um, it would also be not simple. And it would also be not closed. This one would fail on all three counts. <laughs> it's a colossal failure, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the other slide that I said. We're going to finish it in just a second. Polygon. A polygon is a simple closed curve. Okay, so that's two of the words we just defined whose sides are line segments. And two sides of a polygon meet at what we call a vertex. So all these pictures on here are, in fact, examples of polygons. Can somebody think of a non-example of a polygon for me? A circle. A circle would not be a polygon. It doesn't even have sides the way that we describe it, right? No edges, things like that. So these are all drawings that are examples of polygons. A square wouldn't be a polygon. 
A square would be a polygon. Okay. Mm -hmm. It would. I was kind of thinking it was. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The majority of our time is going to be spent talking about this particular, today, about this particular shape, polygons and different types of polygons. But before we talk about the specific different kinds of polygons, we're going to define two more descriptions of polygons. Convex versus concave. Convex is a curve that is simple and closed, and its interior contains any segment, I'm sorry, and its interior, yeah, I said that right, contains any segment between two points on the curve. I'll draw a picture. And then a concave curve is one that's simple, closed, and not convex. It's wonderful when you define things by what they're not. It's not convex, so it's concave. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to label the description or the, the diagrams below as to whether or not they are concave or convex. So the kicker is this. If you are able to put points or to locate points on the shape and connect them with a line segment, and the connection is inside, and it always is, then it's a con convex shape. If it ever goes outside of the shape itself, then it's concave. Okay? So let me take a look at the first one with you so I can describe so I can draw it. Uh, what am I doing? Oh, that's what I want. Okay. If I were to take a point on the curve, say this one and this one, and I connect them with a line segment, it will go outside of the shape. Right? And what that does is it makes it almost look like the part that we are sort of going outside of has a cave-like feature. Agree? <clears throat> so that one's concave. And it doesn't matter if some of them are inside, like if I drew it like this and connected it, and that would be inside. But I need all of them to be inside in order for it to be convex. And I have at least one that's not. So this one is considered a con cave curve. Now, does anybody know, we're going to counter this again later, but does anybody know what that next shape is? Decagon. Hexagon? I think decagon. I think I've got ten sides on it, don't I? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's a decagon, and we'll give names to all those and remind you what they are in a minute, but it's a decagon. If I were to connect any point, either on the line segment or on the edges, you know, the actual... Um, sides of it to another point of the decagon, will I be always inside the shape? Yes. Yeah, this one I can't do what I just did before. I can't find two points and somehow traverse outside by a straight line segment. So this one is a convex shape. How about this next shape? It's concave. And if you'd like, you can take any of the points over on these two edges and connect them, and you will be outside. This actually has a name as well, but I won't spoil the fun, and I'll save it till later, because I don't think you probably would believe me right now that that's what it is. So we'll encounter it later. How about the next one? What is this one? Convex. This one is convex. Again, any two points, if I connect them, the line segment that connects them will lie within the figure. All right. Polygons are classified by their number of sides. So I'm going to let you write these in. The first one I know you remember, three sides is a triangle. You probably remember that four sides is a quadrilateral. Five sides is a pentagon. And six sides is a hexagon. A lot of times we check out on number seven. Maybe because it's hard for us to draw them, so you don't see them drawn very often. Seven is a heptagon. Eight is a familiar symbol for us because we have stop signs, right? Eight's an octagon. Nine, again, we kind of check out on this one because we don't see these very often. They're nonagons. And then ten is a decagon. And truly, we don't see decagons very much either, but, you know, there's something special to us about the number ten. So this is one we tend to remember as well. 
So our least commonly remembered ones are probably seven and nine heptagons and nonagons. When we name a polygon, like we talk about square, A, B, C, D, or triangle, you know, whatever. When we talk <laughs> about a polygon and we give it a name, we name it by the by the vertices that are in order, like consecutive. So you have to go around the shape, you know, in one continuous motion. You can't kind of bounce around and give me different various, um, you know. And the reason you can't is because it tells you the order, and if you went in a different order, you would create things that weren't simple and closed, and simple and closed is what's required in order to be a polygon, right? That's why we've got that ordering in there. All right, so we have a special connection within a polygon. And that connection is a diagonal. So a diagonal is any line of a polygon that connects non-consecutive vertices. So vertices is just plural of vertex. If you were to take vertex A, B and D are called consecutive vertices to vertex A because you can get there by going along the line segment and not crossing through any other vertice. But C would be considered a non consecutive vertice. So this would be a diagonal of this shape. And notice I used the word a diagonal. Most shapes, not all, but most shapes when you're dealing with these, we're dealing with something that has more than one diagonal. Okay? So there's one of them. And here's another. Right, so this one has two diagonals. And if we were writing out or asked for what are the diagonals in the shape, the diagonals are line segments AC and BD. And you guys remember to put those line segment symbols on top of them. Without the line segment symbols, it means it's the measurement of it, the length. If you put lines on top of them, we've got lines going through things, right? And these are actually the line segments that we're talking about for being the diagonals. All right, polygonal angles. An interior angle, or what we usually just end up calling angle, is any angle of a polygon determined by two sides having a common vertex. And in this diagram that is in your notes, right, which of the angles on here would be considered interior angles? All of the alphas. Yeah, they're alphas. So alpha looks like this one. So alpha 1 up to alpha 5. There are five on this particular shape. And exterior angles are angles of a convex polygon formed by one side of the polygon and ex an extension of an adjacent side beyond the polygon. So these are all the blue angles that are marked in my diagram. So let me kind of talk about the description because it sounds a little funny. So this would be considered a side of the polygon, right? And this is an extension of the other side that's nearby, right? The part that's extending beyond the polygon, but it's, it's the other half, if you will, of the line or the other portion of the line that's missing if you were not to consider it, um, not to continue it. So this right here would be considered an exterior angle. So the exterior angles in this diagram are the betas. So beta 1 up to beta 5. All right, congruent segments. We're going to do congruent segments, and then we're going to do congruent angles. So these two next slides are going to look almost identical. Congruent segments are two segments of exactly the same length. Okay? We use the symbol congruent. So there's not a line here on my paper because I, or my screen because I was afraid that it would make it look like there were three lines, and there aren't. It's the squiggly, you know, the tilde shape with the two lines underneath it. This is the congruent symbol. This indicates that two segments are congruent. This shape, as you know, means equal. We use equal when two segments have the same size, shape, and location. Okay? 
right, which would be rather unhelpful, right? So we're going to use that congruent symbol a lot, and we're not going to use the equal symbol very much at all. In <laughs> fact, what we tend to see used is we use the congruent symbol when we're talking about geometric shapes, and we use the equal symbol when we're talking about the measure of the shapes. Like when we're actually talking about the measure of the angle, and we'll see that on the next slide, or maybe it's not this one, next one, maybe it's a couple later, but um, we'll see the equals used, but in a slightly different way. Okay, but here, if we're talking about congruent segments, like the segments themselves, we use the congruent symbol. Two segments marked with the same number of hash marks are understood to be the same length. And you can see them on my diagram, they're, they're marked in blue just so that you can distinguish them really clearly. Um, but you mark them both with the same number of hash marks. So they're both marked with one blue hash mark. If they're both marked with two blue hash marks, they'd be the same. It is on the next slide. Okay, concurrent angles. Two angles that have the exact same measure are considered congruent angles. So again, we use that congruent symbol to indicate that the two angles are congruent. Now, you saw this already in your homework for today. You saw them use this M at the front of this. That M means measure of. So it actually means it's a numerical value. It's like when we did segments, and I said if you don't have anything on top of the segments, it means the length of the segment, not the segment itself, right? When you put the M in front here, it means the measure of the angle, not the angle itself. So it is appropriate to talk about two <coughs> measures of angles being equal, because those are just numbers, right? If this one's 50, this one's 50, and 50 equals 50. But it's not appropriate to talk about the angles being equal unless, like Brendan said, they actually lie on top of themselves. And why would we describe them that way? There might be an occasion to do so, but that's typically not what we're looking at. We're typically looking at two separate angles that are simply the same size. So in this diagram right here, you can see, oh, let me say the one last thing. Two angles are marked with the same number of arcs, those pink sort of swoops. Um, are understood to be congruent. So we see this angles on this side. Oops, let me use black here. This one and this one are both marked with this, the arcs and one hash mark, so those two are congruent. And these two over here are marked with the arcs and two hash marks, so those two are congruent. So if there's not multiple sets of angles, they might not even mark them with hash marks. They just might mark the arc only. It just depends on the diagram and what they're showing already on there. But taking a look at this one, what we could write is we could write two separate things. So one option is we'll take a look at the left-hand side of this since we already have it up there. If we look at these two pieces right here, we can talk about those angles being congruent, right? So we can talk about the fact that angle DAE is congruent to angle E, A, B. Those two angles are congruent. Or we can talk about them as the measure that they both create or that they both have is the same, and we can put an equal sign in between them. So if we have the M's in front, we use equals because it's talking about the measure. If we don't, we talk about the angles themselves, they're congruent. All right, so more about congruent or equal uh, measures of angles. If you have an equiangular polygon, then it means that all of the interior angles are congruent. And if you have an equilateral polygon, and these are both convex polygons, it has all of the sides congruent. Now, just because the angles are congruent doesn't mean the sides are congruent, and just because the sides are congruent doesn't mean the angles are congruent. But if they are, they have a special name, and they're called regular. It's called a regular polygon when it's equiangular and equilateral. And the most, probably the most common regular polygon that we encounter on a regular basis is what? You know? The most common polygon, a square. A square is your classic example because it's got a specific name that means it's both things, equiangular and equilateral. And we're going to reference a square in a minute here. But there's lots of polygons. When you see your stop signs, a stop sign is a regular polygon. I mean, it is. Um, 
because of the way that they're created too. So you see regular polygons quite frequently. In fact, they're the ones, by and large, that you're more comfortable with. All right, so here's your next first exercise of the day. You're going to create two pictures. Don't look at anybody else's because there's lots of answers that are correct here, okay? The first one, I want you to create a polygon that's equal angular, equal angles, but not equilateral. And the second one, I want you to create a polygon that's equilateral, sides are the same, but not equiangular. Okay? So I'm going to give you, I don't know, we'll take two or three minutes to do it because you might have to think about this to create one. Who thinks they have one that fits number one? Okay, we'll take Brendan's first and then we'll do your Ash Ashley. What do you have, Brendan? Uh, I just did a rectangle. A rectangle. Is that what you did too? Did anybody do anything different than a rectangle? Okay. Second one's harder. Um, I will say, I didn't tell you this before, but I will tell you that if you were trying to use triangles, that's not going to work because a triangle is always going to be both. If it's either one or the other, it has to be both. So the minimum number of sides you had to be looking with was four sides. Um, and it's sufficient to use four sides to do both of them, actually. So a rectangle is a great example on the first one. Okay, but there are other examples you could use. Did anybody else have a different example on the first one? Okay. Um, one thing you could do is if you imagine your rectangle shape is basically taking a square and elongating it, you can do that with a stop sign too, right? Couldn't you take a stop sign and sort of like pull it apart, kind of like you would Play-Doh or something like that, and it didn't break, you know? You could do the same thing. All right, did anyone get something on two? What you have, Warren? Um, I think it's, I don't remember, I think it's called the rhombus, but it's kind of like a sideways square. Yeah, so we got to keep the side lengths the same. So we can't be just a parallelogram, which we'll encounter kind of that in a minute. We need the sign lengths the same, but we're, we're, we're tilting it, right? And so a rhombus is a good example of this one. Equilateral but unequilangular. Oops, hang on. We'll see if I can draw it with the tools. This is a terrible picture, but okay. pretend. What'd you have, Brendan? It says diamond, which is just the same thing. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. I did like an arrow thing where it's like. Like. Like how if you build a house, but then the house went like this under the bottom. Like this? It's, it's, a, it's a it's a concave like, hexagon. Is what she does. Yeah. Concave hexagon. So it looks like is that one? I think that would work because instead of the the two going down like this, they're just going up. So they'd be the same okay, so you did something like. Yeah. Okay. So something where you did like this. Okay, cool. Chevron, there you go. Yeah, um, there's lots of ways to do this one, but you have to think a little bit harder because, you know, the, the rectangle is just so nice. <laughs> the first one is pretty friendly. Um, you can also do um, like a pentagon, like the house, you know, when you do it like in the shape of a house. You guys know what I'm talking about when people draw a pentagon with the four side, five sides, like the three sides on the base and then the house pieces on top, you know, the roof pieces. You could do that one pretty easily on that one too. Definitely not going to be equiangular, um, but it could be definitely equilateral if you draw it appropriately. So there's lots of options on these. All right, so let's talk specifically about a couple of common <laughs> polygons. In particular, we're going to do triangles and quadrilaterals. So on triangles... A triangle first could be classified by its angles. So the three classifications for a triangle by angles are acute, right, and obtuse. An acute triangle is a triangle with three acute angles. A right triangle has at least, ha, or not at least, it has one right angle. And a obtuse triangle has one obtuse angle. It's worth noting that the right triangle and the obtuse triangle also have two acute angles. Correct? So you can't just say, say there's an acute angle, so it's an acute triangle. You have to have all three acute to be an acute triangle. The other ones have acute, tri acute angles as well. So just for fun, let's label these really quickly. What's the first one? This one's acute. What's the second one? Right. right. And in most cases, if you don't see the right angle marked, 
It's probably not marked on purpose. It might look kind of like it's a right angle, but don't make the assumption that it is. Look for the actual marking of the right angle before you make the assumption. And the last one is obtuse. Okay, so this is one way to describe um, triangles by their angle measures. The other way is to describe them by their side lengths. So if you're going to describe them by their side lengths, you could be equilateral, isosceles, or scalene. So equilateral means that you have three congruent sides. And like we mentioned just a minute ago, if there are three congruent sides, there are also three congruent angles. Uh, but yeah, equilateral, three congruent sides. Isosceles means it has two <coughs> congruent sides. And scalene means it has no congruent sides. Now I'm going to mention this not to make you confused, but if the triangle is equilateral, it's also isosceles by the definition, right? The definition says two congruent sides. An equilateral triangle has two congruent sides. So it's not the best description for it, but it still would actually be an appropriate description for it. All right, in terms of pictures, the first picture here is equilateral and isosceles. So if you'd like to write that down as well, it's, again, true of this shape. This one's equilateral. The second one is isosceles. No, I don't think I spelled it right. I left an E out. Okay? And the last one, of course, is scalene. And even on a scalene triangle, you need to be careful because this could be that the two long pieces are actually congruent. And you might even think that they really, really are. But if they're not marked that they are, then don't assume that they are. Okay? The markings are supposed to tell you whether they are or are not congruent. All right, quadrilaterals, that's our four-sided four -sided figures. Okay, so the way that I've done your note sheet is um, that I've tried to kind of group them together so that you don't have to keep repeating pictures over and over again. Um, and so the first one I've grouped the trapezoid and the isosceles trapezoid. So a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with one or two pair of parallel sides. And I will tell you right now that this definition is not a universal definition. This is the one that this book that we're using uses. If you're teaching geometry um, to young children or to middle grades or even in high school level, some textbooks will tell you that a trapezoid has exactly one pair of parallel sides. So be careful. Our book says one or two. It's terrible, isn't it? Our book would have square would be a trapezoid, but a different book it would be. Correct. It's awful because that, that doesn't happen very often in math where one something so different, and that one really is quite different. All right, an isosceles trapezoid is a trapezoid with two pair of congruent base angles, okay? So congruent base angles means the angles down here are the same. And the way that that ends up working out, and we'll talk more about this um, at another time, if those two are the same, we also get the congruent sides. They happen in pairs. And if we get the two congruent sides and the two congruent base angles, by default, we get these as well. So you get all of those. So any of those pieces being marked, one or, you know, one, any of those pairs of pieces being marked is enough to actually know that it's an isosceles trapezoid. So I'll label that one right now. This one is an isosceles trapezoid. Now, the first picture and the last picture are not isosceles trapezoids, but they are trapezoids. And again, what we're looking for is we're looking for the two pair of parallel sides. So I'll mark them like that. Now, those two are parallel. And it would be better if they were marked. These diagrams don't have them marked. And these two are parallel. So this one's also a trapezoid. Okay, the next two that kind of group together nicely are parallelogram and rhombus. So a parallelogram is a quadrilateral in which both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. So according to our definitions, a parallelogram is also a trapezoid. Okay? Feels so awkward and weird, but that's the definition. So parallelogram to quadrilateral, both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. And then a rhombus has that feature as well, but it's also equilateral. 
Okay. So the first shape on here is very clearly not a rhombus, right? This one is a parallelogram only. And I know technically a trapezoid. I got it. Okay. But we're on the parallelogram slide, so I'm going to start with parallelogram. The next one I will go ahead and mark since it's not on your diagram. These four are intentionally drawn so that they are congruent. And that makes this a rhombus. That's the most specific name for it, right? Again, it's also a parallelogram and it's also a trapezoid. But the most specific way to call this is rhombus. The next shape has a very specific name. What's it? It's a rectangle. We're not on the rectangle slide, though, right? So I'm going to not write down the rectangle yet because in theory you don't know about it because I haven't defined it. Okay? So as best you can describe with the words up to this point, what is this shape? It's a parallelogram. That would be the most specific name thus far. And this shape right here, again, I'll mark them since they're not marked because they're intended to be so. Don't go marking things like I just did. That's an inappropriate thing to do, okay? But you know what? Sometimes when you're grabbing slides and stuff and putting together, it just doesn't work very well to mark stuff. So we're going to pretend like they were marked already, okay? All right, good. What is the shape? This is a rhombus. Also parallelogram, also a trapezoid. All right, we will pick back up here next time. We'll talk a little bit more about quadrilaterals and then um, move into how these all go together, how they all relate.